the recording should start now. Yeah, the recording has started. Good. So let's go back. We just saw such an amazing rescue of uh, Peter while the people are praying. Then, um, you know, such a similar rescue. There's an example uh, uh, that you know I have read about, and this is uh, from the life of um, Sadhu Sundar Singh, uh, who ministered in uh, Tibet. Uh, that apparently once he was caught like this, and then you know he was he was also thrown, not in a prison but in a well where uh, other offenders had been thrown and the well was closed and it was a scary situation because in the well you had they would throw the people and close it uh, so you had like you know bones and uh, corpses of people uh, uh, at, uh, in the well and uh, you just kind of had to wait for your death uh, in it uh, but the the uh, story goes something like uh, he saw a rope uh, being uh, put through and uh, uh, with a with a loop okay where he could keep his foot because apparently he was not able to hold the rope uh, in a strong way uh, but somehow he had fallen and injured his hand so there was a loop where he could put his foot and he could hold on to the rope and somebody pulled the rope up and he came out of the well and you know he was uh, rescued from the well and then uh, when he just got off uh, and he turned around to say thank you to whoever rescued him, apparently there was nobody. Okay, And that's what the story says. And uh, he went back where they had caught him preaching, you know, same way how usually Peter, we, we find that, you know, the angel first time, it, uh, the uh, once he was rescued, uh, he's commanded to go back to the same place and preach. So he goes back to the same place. So Sadhu Sundar Singh went back to the same place to preach. And uh, the officials who had imprisoned him uh, or, or thrown him in the well, they are surprised. They bring him to uh, uh, the 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 main person, the main authority, and that authority is furious. And he was wondering who is who was so careless, you know, to to leave the keys uh, 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 without uh, in an unsafe way that people could open the well and get this man out of the well. And the authority was furious. But it seems, you know, there was there was the key which had access to the well. It was actually on the belt of that same authority. So he found out that the key was with the person himself. Okay. So you can imagine they understood that it was not a human being who rescued this man, but it was a supernatural rescue because he was with the authorities. And how did he come out? You know, same way, like Peter, uh, where the chains broke and the iron gate opened. You know, it, it's amazing. We don't even know how such a thing can happen. No wonder the believers who were praying, they were astonished because they knew that this was such a difficult task. But God supernaturally was able to rescue Peter and bring him out. So let us see, you know, what continues to happen. Now, so now Peter is rescued and the believers uh, have received an answer to their prayer. And we have understood uh, that and Peter has escaped and he departed and went to another place. So now you don't really read about him anymore, actually, because the scene is going to shift. The focus is going to go more towards Paul. And, uh, uh, you know, Paul's missionary journeys about Peter and his ministry. It's kind of, you know, this is as much as we read in the Bible. So Peter has escaped. OK, God caused Peter to escape from Herod. Uh, then what happens next? OK, obviously, there is a lot of turmoil uh, in the city. How could, you know, the, the soldiers explain themselves? To Herod. So then you find that there was a, a great confusion among the soldiers um, as to how this man Peter actually escaped. Uh, then Herod 
okay when he tried to search for peter he also could not find him so it says that he checked with the guards and he commanded that the guards be put to death so that's how they would uh, treat the guards who let a prisoner escape how unfortunate isn't it so uh, no wonder the soldiers were so scared because they knew they are going to die the prisoner has escaped now the only thing that can take place is their uh, execution so the soldiers or the guards were put to death and then you know uh, we we find that herod okay herod uh, becomes very very angry he becomes very angry and he goes to yeah just a moment i'll just read this for us i think that will be clearer okay now herod had been very angry with the people of tyre and sidon but they came to him with one accord and having made blastus the king's personal aid their friend they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country so you know we have uh uh herod here who kind of deals with the situation and he goes okay to visit uh, uh, another place and he stays there and at that time you know we have herod uh, he's going to make a speech and he comes to um, you know the people of tyre and sidon he's actually angry with them uh, because of the way you know they they had uh, made blastus okay a person uh, the king's person laid their friend and he was not happy with them at all okay so uh, king herod he set a day uh, he uh, he uh, kind of um, you know prepared himself for a speech okay uh, and he sat on the throne and he wanted to kind of address these people so that is his agenda so now he dealt with peter's death situation he is gone to another place and over there um uh, to uh, a people who made him angry he just wants to kind of you know address them so we'll see what exactly happens so uh, obviously you know looking at the way herod is behaving throughout he is trying to please the jews he is trying to please the other officials he is very like a political person uh, and he seems to enjoy fame and glory and appreciation of people so uh, he is getting ready to make a speech and we are told here that he is dressed very well okay arrayed in royal apparel and uh, you know people who have kind of analyzed you know what kind of clothes herod would have worn impressive clothes uh, they say it's something like you know with uh, uh, with precious precious uh, metal uh, shiny clothes you know that those kind of clothes he would have worn and uh, he wanted to make a speech and you know how you also have crowds that that feed or enable this kind of a, a personality so the people you know when he's going to make a speech they start shouting you know giving positive feedback to the to the orator to the speaker to the king and the people are shouting back and saying oh this is not a voice of a god and uh, this this is a voice of a god and not a man uh, you know how you know they kind of play together with with those who like fame right so they are also saying ah you are not a man it's it's like your like god look at the glory okay herod is come in his magnificence uh, he has come uh, uh, you know in his shining clothes so people are also praising him just like god what happens at that time you know something very uh, very scary takes place we read that the angel of the lord strikes herod okay what is herod trying to do you know it's like if you look back at the old testament a very proud ruler nebuchadnezzar he is so proud that he is exalting himself uh, to be equal with god or you know even thinking of himself greater than god then god humbles him 
okay so he goes through that phase where uh, god kind of brings him to his knees and then yes you know he comes back uh, being reverent to the god of daniel and here something very similar the heart of herod is corrupted okay and we know from scripture that pride is something that god hates god hates it and herod is in a position where just like his uh uh his grandfather what did his grandfather do you know his grandfather was ready to to kill jesus uh, and and we know that i think it was his uncle who uh for the sake you know of of uh, uh, uh for the sake of herodias okay he was will he beheaded john the baptist so he is coming from a family of uh kings and rulers who walked in pride who wanted to do things for their own convenience okay who wanted to do things which were pleasurable for themselves okay so an attitude of pride before god and this man he's standing up and you know he is like oh the whole kingdom is for me i have everybody's uh, okay everybody is glorifying me he's in that place of pride and he's standing uh, to make a speech and look at this you know god sees that pride and scriptures tell us proverbs says pride goes before a fall and in the case of herod over here it was the very end of his life you know god god uh, obviously was so upset and angry with herod that he sent an angel and it was judgment on herod so while he's just kind of glorying in himself what happens an angel comes strikes him why because herod did not give god the glory so you see glory belongs to god glory does not belong to man when man tries to take god's glory what happens he can't handle it man cannot handle it the angel struck herod herod died on the spot what was the end of you know a glorious king he was eaten by worms and he died so uh, we can imagine that you know he would have i, I don't know in medical terms what happened to herod he was just standing on the stage you know making his speech enjoying his his fame among the people suddenly he fell and then you know his death uh, uh, was followed by the kind of uh, you know his body decaying and worms eating up his body okay such a sad end for a glorious king but what brought about this end you know the bible teaches us that god hates pride and pride is what brought such a great destruction in the life of king herod okay? so that is something that we must be careful about now after the death of herod you know throughout what are we seeing there are some positive events like the church of antioch is doing very well and we read more people were added to the church we read also of challenging times where the uh, uh, the the disciples were persecuted the apostles were persecuted what do we read even after that the church was growing the church was continuing to be a blessed community so after herod died what do we read in verse 24 but the word of god grew and multiplied so no matter what is happening around the the believers among the believers god's word is growing and multiplying remember we started studying about the book of acts uh, uh, and we gave one description and said it's like the wild fire forest fire which spreads okay no matter what and similarly the word of god nothing is able to stop the word of god the council the king the authorities so many people are trying to stop the work of god but the way gamaliel said he said if this is god we cannot stop okay they are not able to stop the word from spreading and it multiplied now i told you there is going to be a change of people on the scene so peter we have read about his ministry till now we don't read about his ministry anymore barnabas and saul 
so these are the people whom we are going to read about in the next chapter so barnabas and saul they returned from jerusalem so what were they doing in jerusalem everyone do you remember from antioch they went to do something what did they go to do in jerusalem they went to went to help help out the ah. in the in need very very yes yes exactly so they went to provide relief based on what agabus had prophesied okay so now they are returning that's how we understand this so they are coming back after giving the aid to the uh, people in jerusalem they had fulfilled their ministry meaning they had fulfilled their service of providing relief and they also remember in jerusalem when peter was in prison the prayer was going on in the house of mary whose uh, uh, whose son is john mark okay so there is this young person they have come back from jerusalem with this person john mark so obviously he he is a devoted person in his house prayer is going on so seems like a godly individual so they come back with him and he becomes the assistant of uh, paul and barnabas now let us see after all this what is going to take place in in the journey so barnabas and saul finally they are back in antioch now we move on to acts chapter 13 now acts chapter 13 is the place from where the missionary journeys of paul are starting out so we will read about some places don't get confused or don't get hassled that oh new names how are we going to remember the names so don't worry about that uh, i will you know once we get into this i will show you some maps and that will kind of clarify you know the journey that uh, um, is being made by paul but for now you kind of just make a note oh okay they are going to this place and the next place and some other place and what is happening in those places right that is more important so you make uh, that we have an understanding of how god is working so uh, in acts chapter 13 you know they are in antioch in the church and uh, there are you know there is a team so this is also another speciality of the church of antioch you know it was a well equipped church it was a church for one year god's word was taught to them the prophetic uh, was released in their midst okay and then they also were a church that responded to the needs of the people now there is team ministry going on in the church of antioch there are a certain set of certain prophets and teachers it says okay so how beautiful so it's a church where you have leaders you have people flowing in the teaching anointing you have people flowing in the uh, prophetic anointing there is a list of names that we see there is barnabas there is simeon who was called nigger there is lucius okay there is manian and there is saul so there are five prominent names that we see barnabas we already know who that is saul we already know simeon is called as nigger okay and in in uh, uh, their times when somebody was called a nigger mostly you know, they were they were of african origin uh, also uh more specifically maybe a you know darker skin tone uh, so they would use that term uh so you know we are able to understand that people of different ethnicities were part of the church of antioch okay so it's like a multicultural church even in those times so today uh, when there are divisions in churches because oh you're from this ethnic group i am from the other ethnic group you're from this background i am from that background you know it sounds so unlike the early church because in the church of antioch you had people from different ethnic groups also and simeon was called nigger so he must have been from africa and also people speculate and say this simeon was the one who carried the cross right at some point where jesus was for some help uh, a man called simeon uh, had come to help jesus so it's probably that same simeon who from that 
point onwards was a disciple of Jesus. There is the name of a man called Lucius. Uh, we know we don't know too much about Lucius, but Menian is said that you know he grew up with Herod the Tetrarch. Herod the Tetrarch was uh, the one who beheaded John the Baptist. So he grew up with Herod the Tetrarch. So you see here, even in the background of the individual, there is a uh, like a status uh, description of his status. So he must have come from a, a, a well-to-do family if he grew up with Herak, Herod the Tetrarch. But he gave himself to God's ministry. So you have people who may have been, you know, wealthy and uh, uh, not so wealthy. We see that Manian was a man who was probably from a very well-to-do background, uh, but he's part of the team. So the multicultural team, right? Uh, the the uh, like diverse abilities which the leaders had. It all makes for a beautiful teamwork in the church of Antioch. So you don't see only one pastor. It's not like, you know, hey, there is one pastor for the church of Antioch and that pastor is doing everything. But you see team ministry. That is also a beautiful thing uh, that we observe in the church of Antioch. Okay, so what are these people doing? It seems like you know, they had a, a, a way of seeking God. In verse 2, they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Okay, so see, many times we think ministry is only serving the people. It's true. But in the Old Testament or under the Old Covenant, what was the responsibility of the priests? The priests ministered to God and they ministered to the people. Right? So they ministered to God on behalf of the people and they ministered to the people on behalf of God. We find that one of the responsibilities of every human being, okay, and in the new covenant, we know we are all priests unto God. So, ministry to people is important, but we should not replace ministry to God, right, with only ministry to people. It is important for us to minister to God or serve God. How do we serve God? You know, we can serve God through our devotion prayer, time in the word, doing, uh, you know, our, our spiritual sacrifices. Apostle Peter talks about it, you know, our giving to, uh, uh, because of, of the leading of God, we give, right? So even that is an act of sacrifice uh, that we do. So all these spiritual acts to minister to the Lord, our praises to the Lord, ministry to God is very important. You know why? Uh, a lot of... Uh, if you trace back to the burnout of many uh, spiritual leaders, you will go uh, to a place where uh, you know you you will understand that they were not spending time with God. Recently, recently I was listening to a minister of God, uh, you know, talking about such a successful ministry that he had. You know, he was traveling. You know, morning he was preaching in one church uh, by. Uh, uh, Afternoon, he was preaching in another church. Then evening again, he was taking a train and going to another church and preaching. So like three, four services every Sunday. You can imagine what a busy life that person would have had on Sundays. And even midweek, you know, people were calling for conference, seminar, so many things he was engaged in. Then one day as he was praying, uh, uh, I mean, he was not having enough time of prayer. But still, you know, one day when he was speaking to the Lord, God told him, you know what? I want you to stop everything because you're not spending any time with me. You're just running around, you know, and you're you're trying to strengthen other people spiritually, but you yourself do not have sufficient time with me. So, you know, he shared his testimony how uh, he was very upset and he had gotten so used to being busy in the ministry that he did not even know how to stop. But he said, okay, Lord, if this is what you're asking me to do, uh, I'm going to stop doing this and I will take time. So he took a few months uh, time in his own house. He didn't go any, anywhere. He just told everybody, I can't come. But he only prayed. He fasted some days. He read the Bible and he said, okay, God, you speak to me. I'm only going to minister to you. Right? So you see the early church knew this, this basic principle. 
that ministry to god is also equally important if not more important so we have to spend time with god we have to first of all get our grip and anchor in the lord okay and then ministry to the people so we find here the leadership of the church of antioch what were they doing they were ministering to the lord so in the testimony that i was uh, speaking about you know uh, that person uh, is quite a young pastor uh, uh, and uh, uh, in india and now he runs a very uh, like a good dynamic church uh, god called him back right to ministering to the people but it was a season in his life where god taught him that he was doing ministry the wrong way he had to make sure that every day he also ministered to the lord and then ministered to the people so uh, my point is we must not in fact we must give the highest priority to ministering to the lord otherwise what will happen no input only output burn out okay and god does not want us to be in that position so here the leaders are ministering to the lord then when we minister to the lord what happens they were praying obviously right and also it says they were fasting so that means they were seeking god when do we fast generally you know when we when we are uh, uh, kind of seeking the lord about something we are dedicating ourselves to the lord we want to hear from god so they were sincerely seeking god so when you minister to god what happens god pours back into our lives and god speaks so holy spirit said so when we minister to god one of the things we can expect god speaks to us so when they were ministering to the lord holy spirit gave them direction and told them separate to me barnabas and saul for the work to which i have called them so god is telling them okay come on now another season of ministry is starting for the kingdom of god and also for your leadership and i am going to uh, uh, pick out two individuals barnabas and saul and what i want you to do is till now they were serving in your church but release them now you must release them barnabas and saul because i have another assignment okay so you know our life is made up of assignments right god keeps leading us yes there is a life vision you know god calls us for something that he wants us to do but in that journey there can be different assignments so till now what was barnabas saul assignment you preach in antioch come on you strengthen the church now time is up the holy spirit says okay let me direct you next stage barnabas and saul i have another responsibility for you so god speaks to the leadership and tells them you please separate them or you get ready to release them then after having fasted and prayed what do they do they lay hands on them laying hands uh, in the early church it, you know it's a way of commissioning okay or blessing uh, the people and kind of you know together letting them go releasing them so they are commissioning the people and also commissioning involves you know praying and releasing the empowering of of god's spirit upon the lives of these individuals and they commission them and they send them away so this is where you know your uh, commissioning is uh, is noticed we do this right even in bible college when generally your course is over we pray we impart from the work of the spirit over your lives and we say okay come on okay now your next season where god is calling you to other assignments god is calling you into the purposes which he has for you we release or in this case we read send them away so paul and barnabas come on now you go you do the work which god has called you to do time up in the church of antioch so they move on uh, now the journey starts okay and how how did they know where to go what to do the holy spirit the holy spirit said to them you do this i'm going to give you other tasks now now sent by the holy spirit holy spirit is guiding them they go to the first place that place is called as seleucia and from there they sail to cyprus so they are moving on right they go to seleucia they go to cyprus so they are learning how to follow the spirit okay 
following the spirit is how ministry should be done so they are listening oh okay god you want us to go to seleucia we'll go next go to cyprus so they are traveling in this way now they arrive at a place called salamis okay there they preach god's word and notice that now the ministry which they have started doing in their travel is mainly for the jews okay because uh, that's what god had called them to do uh, and they did not receive any other instruction see peter he got an instruction you go to the gentiles so he went but otherwise you see these leaders mainly ministering to the jews and those days uh, you know in the synagogue in that synagogue uh, format of doing things uh, they could just go to a city and go to a synagogue and in the synagogue they will allow any uh, uh, you know a jewish person knowledgeable person to come and share a word so anybody could go and minister in the synagogue so that's they took that opportunity so they would go to the synagogues that they'll get an opportunity and then they will preach okay now there is a team that is uh, ministering we already have a uh, barnabas and uh, saul whom god had called and then they are doing the ministry but remember they had brought john with them so we are being reminded in verse 5 that john mark is their assistant so he is helping them in the work which they are doing so three people are on the missionary journey you have barnabas saul and mark now they come to a place called paphos okay over here uh, uh once again they want to minister they want to preach about god they find a sorcerer remember philip also had met a sorcerer right a uh, uh, simian we saw simian in uh, 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 samaria and he gave his life to christ now let's see this sorcerer what kind of a person is he scriptures tell us that he was a false prophet okay and uh, he was also a jew and his name is bar jesus uh, he was also known by another name called as elimas and what was his responsibility no he was uh, uh, with a government official or a proconsul and this sorcerer was kind of uh, we don't know you know maybe something like a like an advisor or something like a spiritual overseer for this government official the proconsul uh, his the name of that government official is sergius paulus okay sergius paulus was an intelligent man and we understand that sergius paulus was interested in what barnabas and saul were preaching so he called for them okay he said okay barnabas and saul why don't you come and why don't you tell me what what is this message which you are preaching everywhere so it seems like sergius paulus his heart was soft and it was kind of open to listening about jesus but the sorcerer remember we said bar jesus or elimus he has some kind of a spiritual authority on this government official and he's trying to stop the official from listening to the gospel and he is understanding oh if if uh, uh, you know paul is hears this message he might turn to the faith so resistance spiritual resistance of elimus can be noticed here now for the first time you know saul who also is called paul you know from verse 8 onwards when you read that it's a saul who was also called paul so what is this difference why saul paul two names you know saul was the jewish name of uh, uh, paul and uh, paul is the roman name from now we are going to see more of you know his roman name being used both names are applicable okay but uh, in the in the gospel uh, sorry in the um, rest of the writings paul is is the name that uh, uh, he himself uses even in his writings the epistles he says paul an apostle so paul is a roman name so paul understands okay that this sorcerer is trying to stop the official from responding to the gospel 
Now, if you recall, Peter, in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, by the Holy Spirit, word of knowledge, he understood, why are you lying to the Holy Spirit? Right? That's what he told them. He rebuked them. And judgment came upon uh, those believers. Now, again, by the Holy Spirit, Paul is able to understand this sorcerer is stopping Sergius Paulus from receiving God's word. Now, you know, we when we have talked about prayer and intercession, when we've talked about believers' authority, we said that sometimes, you know, there can be spiritual hindrances due to which people are not able to understand the gospel or receive the gospel. Okay. But when we go against those spiritual barriers, Okay, maybe some demonic uh, interference. You know, we, we must engage in spiritual warfare. We pray against those things. We bind those things. We break those things. Then the veil on the eyes of the people comes off. And they are able to see and understand and receive the gospel. So again, in this case, there is a spiritual battle. The official wants to receive the gospel. But the sorcerer, Elemis, has created some kind of a deceptive barrier, spiritual barrier, and uh, the official is not able to receive it. And Paul sees this in the, uh, through the Holy Spirit, Paul understands this. So he looks at Elimus, the sorcerer, and he says, Oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, you will not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord. And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. So Paul rebukes and pronounces judgment on the sorcerer. And immediately, you know, we read that he became blind. Okay. And he was so blind that he needed somebody's help to walk around. Same thing happened to similar, or let's say similar incident happened in the life of uh, Saul earlier on the road to Damascus. He saw a bright light and he went blind for some time. But you know that was not God's judgment, okay? But here, Sotra was judged by God, and as judgment, he became blind, okay? Uh, and when the government official Sergius Paulus sees this he believed it says okay because the official sees the power of god wow god's power is greater than the dark power the sorcerer must have been still now okay to to provide some kind of a spiritual support to the uh, to sergius paulus but today Sergius Paulus has seen a greater power, which is the power of God, that the sorcerer was judged and he went blind before, uh, uh, you know, in the very presence of Sergius Paulus. So the, it, we are told that the proconsul believed. And when he saw what he had been, what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So one more thing we notice that, uh, the proconsul saw what happened to the sorcerer, but at the same time, you know, one more thing that astonished uh, the the uh, proconsul was the teaching of the Lord. Okay, so you see the work of the Spirit as well as the Word of God. Both are being ministered. The team here, Barnabas, Paul, and Mark, John Mark, how are they ministering? Just like Jesus, you know, Jesus also, he taught, he preached, but he also healed, he delivered, he demonstrated the work of the Spirit. So in the same manner, we find that this ministry team, this missionary team is going all out, teaching the word as well as demonstrating the power of the Spirit. So this is what is taking place, you know, in the first missionary journey of uh, Paul and Barnabas. Now, they continue from this place called Paphos because you know they had seen uh, some fruit in the place called Paphos and they move on to Perga in Pamphylia and at that point 
okay now they have made a, a kind of a, a some four places they have gone uh, visiting and ministered in those places but when they are just moving forward you know we read that this assistant of theirs john mark he goes back to jerusalem remember his house is in jerusalem that's why he is going back to jerusalem okay but you know we do understand that john mark going back to jerusalem was something that paul was not happy about now why did john mark go back to jerusalem there could have been so many reasons maybe there was something urgent right that uh, he needed to attend to at home or uh, you know there could have been some kind of a fatigue right he developed from ministry for a long time he had gone he had stayed in antioch and now he is making a missionary journey with uh, paul and barnabas as a young young missionary maybe he got exhausted he thought oh what is this it's so tiring going with these people and serving god uh, you know 24 bar 7 i need a break we don't know whether that was his attitude uh, but whatever the reason you know john mark goes back to jerusalem and that is something you know we will see later that paul is not at all happy about that okay or maybe maybe john mark got scared men they'll take me into dangerous places in the future uh, how am i going to handle this i better escape right now what was going on in john mark's heart that we don't know but he went back to jerusalem but only later we will see that he was definitely a, a man who was interested in ministry you know he was not a lazy person or he was not a uh, you know person lacking passion because much later in the writings of paul you know paul says okay bring to me uh, john mark he's useful for me in the ministry okay so he was definitely a good uh, missionary but at this point john's going back to jerusalem was an upsetting matter for paul okay but still you notice that the journey is continuing so uh, i think i have shared quite a lot of things with the class today you know we have touched on various uh, events so let me just take a breather i'll uh, give a pause uh and uh, how about you know from whatever you have heard so far you share with me what is it that impacted you or what are you thinking about so let's just take some time to kind of discuss a little bit and then we will pray and close for today yeah quite a lot okay we we saw about the church of antioch how it was doing so well and then we uh, talked about how the leaders went to jerusalem to give aid then from there we observed how herod tried to persecute the church peter was in prison set free by the angel herod died okay and later paul barnabas coming back to antioch ministering to god god speaking to them them going out on a missionary journey with john mark you know going to different places led by the holy spirit and in paphos they minister to a government official also notice how god is touching the lives of people from all sections of society right jew gentile rich poor everybody in the government not in the government and we also see the judgment of uh, a, a negative spiritual influence over the life of sergius paulus okay and then we finally saw how in the middle of the journey john mark he is taking a break he is going back to jerusalem so now you tell me anything that uh, you know you have learned or anything that you are wondering about let's touch on those points in the next few minutes is it like a is it like a story <laughs> unfolding to us yeah 
Great. So, Manu shares, when we pray, supernatural things are taking place. How true? Yes. True, Manu. Yeah. The early church saw that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Any, any, any other insights? A prince, help one another physically and spiritually. Pray for, okay, how they prayed for Peter. Yeah, very true. Correct. Yes, Prince. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Aren says uh, that she really wants to have confidence. Okay. Yeah, like these people had for God. Yeah, amazing, no? Witnesses. How boldly they they traveled, they preached. Yes, correct, Aaron. That's true. Yeah. Please go on. Huh, yes, Kiran shares. Uh, God can do miracles. Miracle. Uh, Miracle work today, life of believers. Then Dev is saying, God knows our every situation and he works uh, in much needed times. Yeah, true, true Dev, yeah, correct. And uh, this is a set of people, they knew how to journey with God and we are learning from their lives. So yes, may the Lord continue to strengthen us in our walk with him and uh, may we also walk you know, in the power of the Holy Spirit. So uh, let's take this time to close today. I would just like to request somebody to lead us in a word of prayer. Uh, and, uh, you know, we will uh, stop for today and then continue in the next class. So anyone, please, could you lead us in prayer? I'll pray, Pastor. Yes, yes, sir. Let, let, me, yeah, let me pray. Well, thank you for giving us this uh, wonderful privilege to study the book of Acts. And Lord, thank you for using Pastor Nancy to be your channel of blessing to us and to many, Lord. So whatever we have learned so far, Lord, change us with your word and help us to increase our personal intimacy with you as we represent you, Lord. So, Lord, if any one of us is struggling from our um, spirit of pride, I bind and rebuke in your name. Because, Lord, Father, it's you who will increase and it's us who will decrease. Lord, so, so, Lord, as we run this race, let us preach you and glorify you, Lord. So, Lord, bless everyone and I submit the grace of the session into your loving hand. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, Aren. And thank you, everybody, for joining. God bless you. Uh, mm -hmm. make, yeah, take care. Take care. Have a wonderful thank day. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. God bless.